Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, once again to Messiah and Messiah alone be all the praise, honor, and glory. And today is the 30th day, right now? Yes. Yeah, today is the 30th day, dear brothers and sisters, of the first month. We are coming to the end of the first month of the year 2020, and today Anna has a Cover sheet for us for our fellowship Friday today. Anna will sing for us. We'll use the karaoke. Okay. As a matter of fact, holy, holy, holy. We once again welcome you all, our returning fellow brethren, to our fellowship Friday. We thank you for joining us, all our returning fellow brethren, for our fellowship Friday. And if you're joining us for the first time, once again, we truly believe, we truly Believe, our dear fellow brethren, that in his house, in Messiah's house, there are no accidents. There are no coincidences. We all are here by a divine appointment to glorify, to honor, to exalt the one to whom belongs all the glory. Because he is glorious and he alone is worthy. Today is the day, as we see Anna has the scripture for us on screen. Today is the day, Psalm 99, 5 says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. He is holy. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the Assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching, dear brothers and sisters, that day is approaching. It is time that we spend the rest of the days, the days that remain in his presence and truly in his presence, trying to retract ourselves from all the Ways, all the different mechanism, more than mechanism, the enemy is trying to lure us with, dear brothers and sisters. We need to truly understand. We need to understand Satan's stratagems. We need to understand that he comes like a lion. He comes to devour First Peter 5 8. Did we pay heed to that? He comes as a serpent. He comes to deceive. Second Corinthians 11 1 through 4 tells us that. Accusation is the chief weapon of the enemy. Did we pay heed to that, dear brothers and sisters? Oftentimes, we try to think that some insufficiency or inadequacy is the enemy's attack. But we forget that 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, there is a three-pronged scheme given there. There is a three-pronged scheme given there, which talks about the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Enemy attacks us, dear brothers and sisters. He himself attacks us. The, he uses the world, lures us with all the glitters of this temporal world. But our most dangerous enemy is our own flesh. When we every time choose to walk by feelings, when we every time choose to walk by what we see, what we, uh, what we understand in our limited knowledge, what sounds good, what sounds rational, what sounds logical, when we try to walk with that oftentimes, dear brothers and sisters, it may not sound terrible in our flesh, but oftentimes that is where the enemy traps each one of us. Today is the day. The psalmist says, Psalm 16, 11, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You will show me the path of life, dear brothers and sisters. The promise is God will show us the path of life, which path we need to go. We don't need to make an informed decision. We, need, we don't need to make a logical choice. We don't need to make an intellectual choice, a scholastic choice. No, none of those are true. God will show us. And that is not only Psalm 1611, Psalm 43 verses 8 and 10 tells us the same thing. All across the scriptures, it is Messiah's promise that Messiah will show us the way, show us the path. But are we truly seeking him? Messiah is the spirit of God. Ruach HaKodesh is our GPS. 
That's the truth, dear brothers and sisters. Just not only our spiritual GPS, but our GPS for the days that remain. Who is our GPS today? That's the question. That's the question. Who is navigating? How are we choosing that? Who is navigating us? Who is show us the? Who is showing us that path? That's very crucial, dear brothers and sisters. John says in in the epistle of John, first John. Chapter 1 verse 3 he says that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ and he continues in verses 5 through 7 he says this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you what is it that God is light and in him is no darkness at all we see if we say if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. Today is the day to come to light. Today is the day to come to that light. Because Messiah says he is the light of the world. And Messiah's command is to be his reflected glory. Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 and 14. That we are called to be. The salt of the earth and the light of the world being Messiah's reflected glory. Where do we stand today, dear brothers and sisters? Whenever we approach our prayer closet, is it always all about us? Is it always all about our needs? And once again, dear brothers and sisters, please don't get us wrong because that is biblically sound to pray for our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. But our, is that the only thing? And are we getting needs and wants mixed up? Because the enemy is at work, dear brothers and sisters. The enemy is truly at work trying to confuse many. Trying to deceive many. Trying to devour many. The psalmist says, Psalm 16 verses 8 and 9, that I have set the Lord always. I have set the Lord always before me. Did I? Did we? What will happen? What will happen if we set the Lord before us always? The answer also the psalmist gives in Psalm chapter 16 verses 8 and 9. We're looking at says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Dear brothers and sisters, our foundation should be on that rock. Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Our foundation should be on that rock. And when we understand what exactly Messiah was telling as he was ending the Sermon on the Mount. As Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 27. Because that we need to be doers of the word. Just hearers we are deceiving ourselves. We need to be doers of the word and that is also, that is the same thing James, half-brother of Messiah Yeshua HaMashiach is telling us. Today is the day to come in his presence. Today is the day to claim his promises, staggering promises which he has for you and me. Today is the day to say your words were found and I hate them and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Today is the day. To claim on the promises, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvel marvelous light. Why, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Staggering, staggering, staggering promises. He has laid out for you and me for his follower. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Messiah says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That abundance is not abundance of materialistic possessions. Abundance is not abundance in fleshly gratification. That abundance is a life led in his presence for his glory. To glorify him, to honor him, to exalt his holy name to the highest. That abundance is about denying, picking up our cross daily, denying our flesh and following him daily. So that we can live that abundant life, not in our flesh, but 
but what Messiah has called us to do. Because he has called us out of the darkness, dear brothers and sisters. And it is time that we get in his presence. Truly, it is time that we get subdued by his glory. In his presence, all with his majesty, filled with awestruck wonder of Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach and his absolute holiness. It is not about the building church. It is not about the programs they are offering. It is not about the atmosphere. It is not about none of those. It is not about fleshly gratification. It is not about like-mindedness. It is about one thing. Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It is about Yeshua HaMashiach encountering that living God. Because our God is alive. The garden tomb is empty. Today is the day if you have not encountered lately. Today is the day to come in his presence and encounter, have a face-to-face -face encounter in the spirit. To talk to him as we read his word, as we worship him together. Let's hold hands together, dear brothers and sisters. Today is the day Messiah said, because, because he is alive. That is why we live, we will live. Today is the day, today is the day once again to get in his presence. Today is the day to just not only know the doctrine of God, but to know the person, the person, person of God, the person of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So today, as we come in His presence, once again, let us invite, let us invite the presence of God so that Ruach HaKadosh can guide us, can lead us into what He has. Let us petition together, Lord, decrease me, make me zero, so that you can become 100% in me. So let us today petition together. Let us bow our hearts, let us bow, let us bow our heads, and let's start with a short word of prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We just praise you, we just praise you, we just praise you. Oh, Holy Father, we just thank you, Lord, for one more glorious day. One more day, Lord. To be in your presence. One more day, Lord, to walk by faith and not by sight. One more day to exalt you, to honor you, to glorify you. And to once again sing praises. Sing praises for your holy name. We thank you, Lord, today. As we gather together, we bring all our dear fellow brethren, every single of our dear brothers and sisters in your presence. As we gather together with all our dear fellow brethren today, once again, Lord, in your holy name, we stand on your word, on your promise of Matthew 18, 20. You said, Lord, where two or three gather in my name, I will be there. I will be there in the midst of them. Father, we stand on your promise. You said that in your presence. In your presence, there is fullness of joy to thee, Lord. Help us, Lord, to run away from happiness. Help each and every single of our dear fellow brethren to run away from happiness and fill us with that joy. Fill each and every single of our dear fellow brethren with that joy. Father, we also pray at this time, Lord, please do pour out your spirit on each one of us. Add your super to this natural and help us to once again experience the supernatural experience of the acts of a room for each one of us lord if it's, that's your will lord to pour out your spirit on every single of our dear fellow brethren and give us lord the love of commitment that apostle paul had towards his spiritual family and help us lord help us lord to keep ourselves our flesh into perspective father please give us the depth of resource lord humility humility that we may exhibit and exalt our lord yeshua hamashiach jesus christ of nazareth may our prayers every single day be a petition for humility rather than a substitute for it help us lord help us lord to take every thought captive as your word commands us in second corinthians 10 5 and acknowledge Acknowledge, Lord, our ownership of each negative thoughts and draw us, Lord, to repentance so that we can forgive others where we feel we have been wronged. Heavenly Father, please give us an unending hunger, a thirst, Lord, for thee and thy word and keep us free, Lord. Please do keep us free from the bondage of legalism or the false comfort of rules. But also, Father, please do equip us in these end of the end moments. Please do equip, equip us with the full armor. For the cosmic warfare that we are engaged in. Please help us Lord. Please help each and every single of our dear fellow brethren today. To see ever more clearly just where you want them to be. Where you want each one of us to be. And help us Lord. To relish, relish. 
the comfort and security that place has shows us. Father, help us to measure everything today once again, especially our credentials, by the cross of Calvary and not by our flesh, Lord. May our own resume every single day reflect gold, silver, and precious stones, and not the quest for wood, hay, and stubble, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help each one of us in these last moments to focus with a singleness of devotion to our Lord that we may not be beguiled or blinded by the wiles of the enemy or the glitter of this temporal world. Help us, Lord, to be Father, please do keep us diligent towards false teachers and treacherous doctrines. But yet, Lord, let us never abandon our first love. For we do love you, Father. We do love you, Father, because you loved us first. Today, help us, Lord, help each and every single of our fellow brethren to see you ever more clearly and thus love you even more, Lord. And Heavenly Father, today, as we read the scriptures together with all our dear fellow brethren, we bring this time and all of them in your presence, Lord, and pray as we read the scriptures together and worship you, Lord. Please do open our hearts and lives to thy word, Lord, and thy words to our hearts and lives. And lead us and to what you have. May there be a transformation in our lives. May there be a revival in our relationship with our Redeemer who lives, who alone is worthy, Yeshua HaMashiach. Help us, Lord, today to worship you once again in spirit and in truth as we surrender ourselves, all our dear fellow brethren, every single of our dear fellow brethren, unto thy mighty hands without any reservations whatsoever. All this we pray in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, the line from the tribe of Judah and the root of David, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen, amen. and amen and amen. All right, dear brothers and sisters. Today we are going to dwell on a staggering psalm, Psalm 62. Psalm 62, dear brothers and sisters, is a staggering, staggering, staggering psalm. We see the author is, of course, King David, where King David in this psalm is emphasizing on two things. One is waiting upon God, silently waiting upon God, and secondly, trusting God. Waiting upon God and trusting God. Dear brothers and sisters, isn't that the theme? Isn't that a psalm written for today, which is addressing impatience, that we need patience to wait upon God, and which addresses unbelief that we need to trust in Him because what God has said is true. And it is true forever because Lord Jesus Christ is immutable. He doesn't change. Hebrews 13, he tells us that Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Psalm 62 is the very is written for this very time. So today, let's open up our Bibles once again and let's get to Psalm 62. Let the Spirit of God once again, dear brothers and sisters, minister our weary souls because these are the promises, dear brothers and sisters. These are the promises what we have. We are in the last of the last moments. And if this is the only thing what you have, the promises of Lord Jesus Christ, then that is the only thing we will ever need because everything else will come to an end. Only God and His Word is going to be forever, dear brothers and sisters. That's the key to understand. Today we need to feed our soul with His Word. We need to shun the devil. It is written that you are a liar. It is written that you are accuser of the brethren. It is written that you are the father of lies, John 8, 44. This is the only way to fight the enemy, dear brothers and sisters. This is the only way to fight those thoughts which the enemy is implanting. Every femtosecond, every picosecond, every femtosecond of our lives. The plank length of time. The pl every plank time, the plank length, the lowest unit of time is, I believe... The, physics, the particle physicists have, have come to the ca calculation. I think it's 10 raised minus 43 seconds. And every plank time, every plank length of time, the enemy is implanting so many lies. Today is the day to feed our soul with truth. So let's jump in Psalm 62. And Psalm 62 also addresses something staggering, which as a matter of fact, is also addressed in Psalm 18 and on, all across the Psalms. As we go along, we'll talk about it. Let the Spirit of God once again minister our hearts, dear brothers and sisters, minister our weary souls, because this is 
Man does not, Messiah said what? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word which comes out of Messiah's mouth. Every word which comes out in the mouth of God, that's what we live on. That's what we survive on. Are we truly believing that? That's what Peter says. The desire, the milk of the word. What? Why is Peter using that metaphor there? We understand what the infants drink milk, right? For the infants, their life de depends on every feeding. Or whatsoever that frequency is every two hours or every three hours. Every, their life depends on that feeding. Is my life depending today? Do I desire the milk of the word? Is my life depending? Am I really feeding my soul? That's a question, dear brothers and sisters, because we can have all kind of form of godliness, but we can not meet Messiah like the Samaritan woman met her Messiah. We need to meet him every day. We need to spend time in his word so that he can reveal more about himself, so that he can reveal his heart to us, so that he can talk to us, dear brothers and sisters, and we can talk to him. It's a dialogue. It's a conversation. And that's what this psalm emphasizes. So let's jump in Psalm 62. And the title says, A calm resolve to wait for the salvation of God. A calm resolve to wait for the salvation of God. So we have 11 verses. We see verses 1, verses 1 and 2 once again. We can see it's a statement of confidence in God. Verse 3 is a direct challenge to the wicked. Then we see verse 4 is a description of the ways of wicked. Then we see verses 5 through 7 is a renewed statement of confidence in God. And then we see a direct challenge to the righteous in verse 8. Verses 9 and 10 is based another further description and warning of the ways of the wicked. And finally, verses 11 and 12. Verses 11 and 12 is a final statement of confidence, a final statement of confidence in God. It's just a staggering psalm. So let's jump in. The title says, I come, resolve to wait for the salvation of God. Isn't that title itself resonate something to the in us, dear brothers and sisters? That a calm resolve. We have to have that. We need to make that determination, Lord. I come with that desire to wait upon you. Give me the strength, Lord. So this is, of course, the title says to the chief musician to Jedithan, a psalm of David. So this says, as a matter of fact, this is called the only psalm. Which the only the Hebrew word verb, he, excuse me, Hebrew ad, adverb is truly or, or only or alone, as we see, as we will see, as we'll read along. And we see Psalm 39, as a matter of fact, was also written to Jedithan, one of the chief musicians. And apparently, I believe Jedithan, he led the orchestra and the choir when this psalm was used. So let's jump in. It's a psalm of David. It's a staggering, staggering psalm. Good scholars think it's perhaps during Absalom's rebellion or in the early years at Hebron. So basically the throne was under attack. And that's exactly when this psalm was written. And that's once again a conjecture, dear brothers and sisters, on part of good scholars. So let's not get into, let's not once again get into that or let's let's not worry about it because that's not the crucial key let the spirit of god speak to our heart so let's jump in king david says truly my soul silently waits for god for from him from him comes my salvation he only is my rock and my salvation he is my defense i shall not be greatly moved. A staggering, staggering statement of confidence in God. That's what we need today, dear brothers and sisters. Let the Spirit of God once again speak to our weary souls. The Bible says the Word of God is active and living. Only the Spirit of God can make it active and living. Today, let us make that form resolve that truly my soul silently waits for God because from Him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. So here we see truly my soul silently waits for God. That's a message for today. Am, is my soul silently waiting for God? 
Does that my, does my, excuse me, does my life demonstrate that? That my soul is silently waiting for God? Am I anxious? Am I trying to look into different kind, all different kinds of proof? Walking by sight. Walking by sight and telling that, well, these are all prophetic news. Dear brothers and sisters, once again, please don't get us wrong. As important as those prophetic news and all the Middle East news and everything it is. But what exactly is prophecy? The spirit of Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us the spirit of Messiah is prophecy. It's all about Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's, it's every, the volume of the book of, is written of me. Messiah said that in him, in it you look for, in the scriptures we look for eternal life. And yet the scriptures testify of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth on every page, on every single page of the Bible. If we truly if we truly are diligent students, God will reveal himself to us. And that's once again, dear brothers and sisters, that's just not a um, figure of speech. That's not just a figure of speech. As we dig deeper in the scriptures, we will truly realize as we understand the macro codes set up in the micro codes and macro codes, as we understand the properties, the properties of the word. The word, the text which is used, the properties, it's just staggering, staggering, staggering. Dear brothers and sisters, more than, super, million, more than millions of modern supercomputers computing and trying to put this together. The properties which the text, the original text has, will, take, will never be, ever be able to do that because it will take millions and millions of years just to get to only just the very first seven verses of the book of Matthew. That's not an exaggeration. That's not a figure of speech. The volume of the book is written of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Prophecy is the spirit of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He and he alone is on every single page. And as a matter of fact, dear brothers and sisters, Whenever, whenever one way to resolve any passage, any verse, one way to resolve it is whenever you have any contradiction in, with any passage, just put Lord Jesus Christ in the middle of it and see what happens. See what Holy Spirit Ruach HaKadosh does. And it's just staggering to see, dear brothers and sisters. It is indeed just staggering to see. So, King David says, truly, truly, my soul silently waits for God. Today, if we are having silently waiting for God, dear brothers and sisters, Messiah understands that. And that is exactly why he has orchestrated prayer, the communication with our Heavenly Father, where Messiah himself is interceding for us. We come in his name and we talk to him. We talk to our Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit helps to intercede for us. Sometimes, yes, dear brothers and sisters, there are no words. Sometimes it's just tears rolling down. And God understands that, dear brothers and sisters. He understands. He knows our heart. It's just not well-worded prayer. He knows our heart where it is. And that is the crucial key. Every single day our prayer should be, Lord, preserve me from my filthy flesh. Preserve me from all the uncleanness in me and around which surrounds me. Help me to be patient, Lord. Help me to trust in you, Lord. Help me to overcome my unbelief, Lord. These are the last moments, dear brothers and sisters. Impatience and unbelief will be the most important key which the enemy will strike us with. Walking by faith will be a problem. It will be all walking by sight. Sight, but it will be in the name, in the there will be a form of godliness. Today, we don't believe that a dead can be raised, a lame can walk again. We have all fancy medical terminologies. When there is a problem, let's say there is, we see some. Whatever it is, a po let's say a person is now paralyzed or, or whatsoever it is. He has some neural, neuropsychotic or, or, or 
a neurological disorder what is the first thing we do do we pray or take take the person to er and then try to find out and then try to understand everything and once again please don't get us wrong dear brothers and sisters messiah said that to one to one who believes everything is possible is god did god mean what he says because it's so very crucial dear brothers and sisters our hermeneutics hermeneutics is just a fancy term for the interpretation of scriptures if we are not taking the word of God's at its face value that what God says he means and he will always mean what he says if he says that to one who believes everything is possible dear brothers and sisters we are just not sharing head knowledge we are experientially talking about it dear brothers and sisters there was no way there was no way that Hannah, our 10 year old daughter, she could have been healed. And we share, we have shared this so many times. Once again, we'll spare you with this. But dear brothers and sisters, it's just staggering. Messiah truly, truly, truly means what he says. Modern medical science, all this frontiers of all the modern science, the biotechnology and all these things. They are no match. They are no match to the powers of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They are no match, dear brothers and sisters. Today we don't truly don't believe. Truly, we don't believe. We need and um, we need a CAT scan. We need an MRI to see. Well, this person probably has undergone a stroke, so we need to see well, what what are the what is the to what extent. What extent the cells has the new the neuronal cells of the cells in the brain have been affected and what, I mean, what is going on? Let's see the different lobes, which lobe has been affected, and on and on and on and on it goes, dear brothers and sisters. That's one way to look at it, but God says that He can heal it. Did I pray? Did I cast out the demon in the name of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Did I take authority? Did I use my authority of Luke 10, 19? Did my use which God gave the power, Lord's power of James 4, 7 and ask the Lord to heal that person? Did I do that? Dear brothers and sisters, to one who believes everything is possible. Today, we see a generation, group of professing believers walking by sight and yet we call it as faith walking by in all kinds of ways which is unbiblical and yet we call them that they are followers of christ dear brothers and sisters we are in the end of the end of the end moments our god is powerful enough dear brothers and sisters he is powerful enough not only to save us from the lake of fire, but he is powerful enough to give us that every single breath to make sure to ensure that the lungs are functioning properly, to make sure that our heart is functioning properly, our liver, our kidneys, all the organs are functioning properly. He is strong enough to make sure all the central nervous system, autonomous nervous system and peripheral nervous system are working properly. And as a matter of fact, if we truly understand, when we truly start understanding what is an autonomous nervous system and peripheral, especially the autonomous nervous system, dear brothers and sisters, it should make us wonder if we study more and more, more and more of neurochemistry of, of we will understand our neurobiology we will understand the more and more we study we understand that there is a supernatural design there is a supernatural design which is orchestrating all this dear brothers and sisters if there are let's say then there is a group of people there are singers and then there are group of musicians to each of the musicians we give them different kinds of instrument let's say to one of them we give the keyboard to 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 the other group we give um, guitar and then violin and th then all the different kind of percussion instruments and give them their music sheet and tell them to play will we get a symphony will we get a symphony that's the question we still need an external input we still need a music conductor to conduct that so that we can have symphony every cell every single cell needs an external input Embryogenesis, when we study about embryogenesis, the formation of embryo, when we study about the zygote formation from that to embryogenesis, when we study the embryology, how do those cells get 
those different signals what to differentiate to what what cells will become limbs what cell will be actually going part of the brain and part of the heart how how does all that happen dear brothers and sisters we start learning a little bit and then we have so much of data points so much of information today so now we are so confused to find out which is signal and which is noise but signal and noise is something which is not only a concept of physics not only a concept of spectroscopy but signal and noise today we have to differentiate between the signal and noise the signal and noise ratio is what will keep our walk our walk we will be rooted built up and rooted in him and walk in him when that signal and noise if we cannot and that signal and noise that this how can we distinguish that is discernment and that is a spiritual discernment that's not an intellectual decision that's not an intellectual decision dear brothers and sisters messiah's power is just staggering this is just not head knowledge dear brothers and sisters if we keep sharing for our personal life what messiah has done dear brothers and sisters and keeps on doing and things which these eyes have seen and witnessed dear brothers and sisters and please don't get us wrong i don't deserve it my family doesn't deserve it none of us deserve it it is his great mercy he is the king of kings he is the lord of lords he reached out and he is reaching out to everybody dear brothers and sisters if we keep describing entire entire we will in until the day of rapture it won't be we won't be even able to share a, a, a third of it that is how it is dear brothers and sisters please do try it out if you're today wherever you are whatever circumstance you are stuck in wherever whatever you are stuck with whatever whether that be betrayals heartaches inadequacies insufficiencies whatever the depth of that pit is whatever those valleys are if whether it is valley valley of death or valley of doubt whatever it is please get to your prayer closet please try him out the garden tomb is empty he is alive give him a chance to work in our lives in your life having plan a b c d god doesn't like that have one plan plan j plan j is plan Jesus Christ I'll have only one plan and try it out dear brothers and sisters you will be surprised beyond beyond any imagination beyond any imagination our god is a great god not only just to head knowledge it may look like that today as we look around but when we go to our prayer closet that is why psalm 73 Please go back and dwell on Psalm 73. If the Lord leads you, please take a look at it. Please read it every day, and just not only read, study it. Psalm 73. That how the psalmist was so confused, looking around, but when he entered the holy sanctuary, the Lord then he realized, then he got the inner insight, and then he understood whatever he is saying is just a deception. that's the key to understand that and that is what this psalm as psalm 62 as we will dwell on we will understand more so truly my soul silently waits for god if it impatience is a problem today we don't have to worry about it why because galatians 5:22 and 23 gives us hope what is that the fruit of the spirit is what love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self control we must have learned that in our sunday school we must have sang so many songs about it but did we stop at the fourth fruit love joy peace after that what is it patience if it patience is my problem then i don't have to make a formal determination to be patient no not at all messiah says i am the vine john 15:5 i am the vine and you are the branches I am the vine and you are the branches whoever abides whoever abides in me shall bear much fruit without me you can do nothing whoever abides in me shall bear much fruit and patience is patience is what the fruit of the holy spirit all we need to do is abide in lord jesus christ if patience is a problem all we need to 
do is abide in Lord Jesus Christ. If we have a problem, and once again, we'll come to trust as we go along, as the psalmist King David says. But if patience is our problem, then all we need to do, the good news is we don't have to make a formal determination. We don't have to produce patience in and of ourselves. We, you make a determination, a strong a resolve, a resolving or, or make a formal commitment or whatever. We don't have to do any of those. We have to abide in Lord Jesus Christ. How to abide in Lord Jesus Christ is in itself is a staggering study, dear brothers and sisters. The starting point, if the Lord leads you, please do go for it. Please do. If you have your strong concordance, please do. A, a good starting point is to do a word study on abide. The strong concordance or, or if you're using the Bible app or the website, you can do a word search on abide and go through it will from the Old Testament and New Testament. It will, it will pull up a, several bunch of re references, passages. Please go through one by one and let only the Holy Spirit, let only Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of the one true living God teach you and open up those scriptures to you. And that is exactly how God can speak to our hearts, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, jumping from one church to another, from one fellowship to another, from one YouTube channel to another YouTube channel, from one Facebook page to another. God may not talk to our hearts because, because once again, all those things can help us. Please don't get us wrong, can help us if it is done in the right way. But we need to have that personal time. Nobody else, motivational speeches are not going to hold water. Nobody else, nobody else knows. Or nobody else has the designer manual. Nobody else, only a creator. Messiah Yeshua HaMashiach, he alone has it. So today, if patience is our pro problem, let's run to him. Let's hold on to his promises. Isaiah 40, 31. Psalm chapter 40, the first three verses. And there are so many of those scriptures. Let's hold on to his promises about patience. The Bible says, blessed are those who patiently wait upon him. And if patience is a problem, he is not condemning us for impatience, but he wants us to run to him. To be honest, to have that heart-to-heart -heart conversation, what you are feeling. Please talk to him and see how relieved you feel when that gets off your chest. How that peace which surpasses all understanding when that covers you, how relieved you feel. Your circumstances, your situations may or may not change, but that doesn't matter. God is in control. He said it. He will do it. It's not our job. Our job is to wait patiently and trust in Him. We need to pray for patience and trust. And that's what the psalm is about. So King David says, truly my soul silently waits for God. The emphasis, once again, in this line is of surrendered silence before God and God alone. The word truly is, it truly is often translated alone or only. That's why it's called the only son. It's translated alone or only and seems to have that sense here. As a matter of fact, it is hard to see this in the English text because the Hebrew is almost untranslatable. But in the Hebrew text, we see the word only or alone. It occurs five times in the first eight verses, verse 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6, and once in verse 9. The Hebrew word is ach. Ach. It is, and the, the word for only is ach. It is an emphasizer to underline a statement or to point to a contrast. It, it's, it's consistent. A repetition gives the psalm a tone of special honestness. Our natural mind, dear brothers and sisters, is ever prone to reason when we ought to believe. Why? We don't think about it. We don't think about logical reasoning as something which is unbiblical or which is something is, which God doesn't want us to do. Do we? When we go back, when we go back to Genesis chapter 3, the knowledge of the tree of the good and evil. What did that bring? The knowledge of the tree of good and evil. That brought us the knowledge of good and evil. That brought us 
what is wrong in it to have the knowledge of good and evil that is something dear brothers and sisters which god will explain to us elaborately on the other side of eternity we are not again once again here to question with our limited finite knowledge we are not here to question god with a brain which weighs what about three pounds i guess with about three pounds three and a half pounds at the max let's say a super brain four pounds today with four pounds we have all the understanding our gray matter has so much knowledge today we have acquired that we are here to question our creator why god told adam and eve not to eat the fruit of the tree of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil today the fallen effects of the knowledge of the good and evil is every time it's logical reasoning it just doesn't sound reasonable it just doesn't fit in that logic we are so very analytical so very logical so very it's always we have this inductive and deductive reasoning this top down and bottom up approach there are models being statistical models being taught there are subjects we which we study to enhance more about the knowledge from the tree of the good knowledge from the knowledge of good and evil consuming more and more taking more and more bites of that fruit that forbidden fruit knowledge of good and evil we cannot take god at his word we need a proof every day and once again dear brothers and sisters please please don't get us wrong and that that includes it's not for condemnation that that includes me as well as i keep sharing dear brothers and sisters that every single day every single day i pray dear brothers and sisters lord help me help me overcome my unbelief help me overcome my help unbelief and help me to believe in you like in mark 9 the broken father of the demon possessed boy when messiah when the disciples could not cast out the demons and messiah then he was telling that it is some demons are stronger you need to do fasting and when he was talking about that then he asked the broken father and that do you believe do you really believe that i can i can cast out the demons of of your son and then what did what does he do he breaks down he breaks down and falls at messiah's feet and says lord help me i want to believe lord help me overcome my unbelief i want to believe lord i want to believe messiah did not condemn messiah did not condemn dear brothers and sisters that broken father why don't we cry out why do we have to run from pulpits to pulpits from bible scholars to bible scholars social media all the different pages on the social media channels to channels why don't you have to do that god himself he is available for you and me 24 7. why do we have to do that god is waiting for you and me for each one of us to talk to him to sit a while with lord jesus christ so that he can share his heart with you and me are we ready are we ready ready to hear about lord's burdens can he share it can he share his heart he is living he is alive he has a heart we are created in his image all our emotions whatever it is it comes from him the greatest act of love what is it the cross of calvary should tell us for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for and when we see the superlatives in john 3 16 all the superlatives for god he the greatest being so the greatest degree love the greatest affection the world the greatest object of love that he gave the greatest act is only the greatest treasure begotten the greatest relationship son the greatest gift 
that whoever the greatest company believes, the greatest trust in him, the greatest object of faith should not perish the greatest deliverance, but have the greatest assurance, everlasting, the greatest promise, life, the greatest blessing. Staggering, staggering, staggering. Staggering, dear brothers and sisters. He is alive. Today is the day to go and talk to him. Our natural mind is always prone to reason when we ought to believe. Our natural mind is always at work when we ought to be quiet. Our natural mind always wants to go our own way when we ought to steadily walk on in God's ways. To trust in his promises. That's so very crucial. Truly my soul silently waits for God. Silently waits for God. The modern buzz is not silence. The modern buzz is truly not silence, dear brothers and sisters. My soul truly, truly my soul, excuse me, truly my soul silently waits for God. If we go back growing up, dear brothers and sisters, and in the, in the 70s, 80s, we didn't have so much going on, did we? But it was so much more quieter, so much more calm, so much more peaceful compared to today. Wasn't it? What has the smartphones, all this modern frontiers of technology, whether it is with all the whether it is with computers, whether it is with biotechnology, the modern modern frontiers of science, information technology, what has that brought to us? Did that bring us more joy? Were we more joyful when we were growing up? As a kid, back in 80s and oh, so many of our fellow brethren back in 70s, 50s, maybe perhaps 40s. When you're growing up, how was it? Does it feel like today we are more joyful with all this abundance of things? Messiah said what? Man is not known by abundance of, abundance of his things. We truly, 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 dear brothers and sisters, Google has substituted God today. That's the truth, dear brothers and sisters. And it does not sound good, but that is the truth. That is why we need to make that conscious effort to come back to him every day. The psalmist says, truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. From him comes my salvation today, dear brothers and sisters. That's a problem. That's a problem in our now single tap smartphone salvation technology, whatever we are seeing. The deceptions unfolding right in our right in front of our eyes, the strong delusion and everything, whatever is working out. As God said, according to God's plan, as everything is going. Because deception was supposed to be the biggest. It is, the scripture says, if we ask, a diligent scriptural study, a diligent student of the word will tell us that deception is the biggest scriptural end time marker. But we are distracted with so many different things that we are not even paying attention to it. Your brothers and sisters, from him comes my salvation. No pastor from the pulpit, no Roman Catholic pastor. And why I tell that once again, I come with that Roman Catholicism background, dear brothers and sisters, where they will force you to do all this confession and things alike and do all the sacraments and things like that and they will and they assure you that you are saved and even after you die you, the heresy of poor pur purgatory and everything dear brothers and sisters is just heresy after heresy because it's a demonic doctrine and that's not only it's not only limited to the roman catholic churches it's not we see the modern pulpits, the modern mode of evangelism, the 20th century evangelism. It's unbiblical. Nowhere we see in the Bible, none of the disciples have ever, have ever practiced such kind of evangelism. Nowhere in the Bible we will find a sinner's prayer. But yet we believe that. 
Yet we believe and we fight battles that a sinner's prayer will save people. But we cannot find this in the Bible, dear brothers and sisters. We can keep going on and on. But the question is, from him comes my salvation. There is no one. If we have relied by any chance, anybody listening, any of our fellow brethren, we beseech you, we beseech you, our dear fellow brethren, if you have relied on somebody telling you that if you said this prayer, you're saved, we beseech you, our dear fellow brethren, don't trust me, don't trust this channel, don't, don't trust any Bible scholar, anybody. Please go to your prayer closet. Please get to your knees. Please ask the Lord. Lord, reveal to me if it's your will. Here I am. Search me, search me, Lord. And show me, Lord, what are the iniquities. And lead me, Lord, in thy way. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Please get to your prayer closet. We beseech you, our dear fellow brethren. Please, please, please don't once again. Please don't risk your eternity on somebody's word. Because the psalmist says what? From him comes my salvation. It comes from Lord and Lord alone. Please don't even trust your heart. Why? Because the Bible says, Jeremiah 17, 9. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. That our heart is deceitful above all incurably wicked we cannot trust we, but we can trust one the one man who gave it all he had why can we not go to him please go to him he is for you he is not against you please do not be afraid please do not shun this opportunity if the lord is leading you please if there is any of our fellow brethren listening to this we beseech you we beseech you our dear fellow brethren please write this moment pause this message please get to get on your knees Lift up your hands and cry out and ask the living God and He will respond to you, dear brothers and sisters. He will respond to you, our dear fellow brethren. Trust in Him. Salvation belongs to Lord Jesus Christ. From Him comes my salvation, the Bible says. The psalmist is telling here. In many psalms we see King David began by telling his great need or describing his present crisis. But here in this psalm, King David began by declaring his great confidence and trust upon God. We don't have to swipe from one Facebook page to the other, one YouTube channel to the other, or one Bible scholar to the other, one book, one book from the other book. We don't have to do one biblical Bible commentary from the other or whatever we are reading, some religious book, whatever. We don't have to do all that. All we need to do is get on our knees and ask the Lord to reveal it. He will show it. Yes, he will, dear brothers and sisters. And once again, our we will definitely, our comment section is open. And our, we will definitely leave our contacts in the description box. Please, please, if the Lord leads you, please, please, please don't hesitate to contact us. Let us pray together. Let us labor together till Christ is formed. It's going to be worth it. Yes, dear brothers and sisters, one soul. One soul is going to be all worth it. It's one soul. If it touches this message, if God wants and it touches, if the Spirit of God opens up and if one soul, it reaches one soul, it's all going to be worth it. It's all going to be worth it. There is a contest. There is a battle going on every day. The enemy wants to take those souls to hell, to the lake of fire. Let's keep praying for each other, dear brothers and sisters. We are in the last moments. God has raised warriors for him. His holy remnant. Let hold hand and let's pray for each other. Let's pray. God, thy will, only thy will and only thy will be done. Crush me, Lord. Crush my flesh. Make me zero. Whatever hinders, whatever hindrances are put in the path from you, Lord, using me. Nullify them. Whatever it takes. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Use me all for thee in thy glory. Let's hold hands. Let's pray together, dear brothers and sisters. Let's keep praying for each other. These are the last moments. It's all going to be worth it. There is a battle. There is a contest going on with the souls being led to hell. 
The enemy, that's what he wants. As the Lord leads us, let's keep praying, dear brothers and sisters. Please let us keep praying. Psalm 62. Once again seems to come from a time of trouble. Yet, yet, King David asks God for nothing. It is full of faith and trust. But has no fear, no despair, no petition. He declares, and staggering now, he declares, He only is my rock and my salvation. If salvation is just a head knowledge, then we perhaps, chances are extremely high that we are at the wrong gate. If salvation is just a head knowledge, we are at the wrong gate. No matter who says what, dear brothers and sisters, please don't risk your eternity based on some logical arguments. The knowledge, the knowledge of the good and evil, which is forbidden to start with. Genesis 3, God's word tells us that. He only is my rock and salvation. King David trusted in God alone for his strength and stability. The description is of a man completely focused upon God for his help. Firmly resolved to look nowhere else. Because God only is our rock. Let us be silent. Meditating, contemplating on our salvation and rely only on God. He is my defense or, or fortress. He will defend me at all times. As a matter of fact, dear brothers and sisters, as King David is describing the personal titles which he has experienced in his life with God, dear brothers and sisters. The homiletic applications are for us that he is my defense. Do I, do I know him that he is my rock? What does that mean? What does that mean is when we go back when Messiah was ending the Sermon on the Mount, he gave a staggering parable about two different about two builders with two different foundations. And that was about one was doer, doers of the word. One was not a doer of the word. The one who builds on the rock. The rock is Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth being doers of his word. Just not hearers. Then we know he is my rock. When God is my rock then I am doers of his word. Because Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 to 27 tells us that's God's word. That's not a speculation or conjecture, dear brothers and sisters. Please don't take my word. Let us be active variants. Let's go back. Search the scriptures. Let's see what Messiah has. Let the roof, let the let Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of one true living God, teach you and me and each one of us. Because that's what it is all about. This is eternal life. John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life. It's not about walking on the streets of gold as we might think in our carnality. This is eternal life. John 17, 3, that they may know thee. That they may know you and his son, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. How do we know him? The only way to know God is the way he chose to reveal himself, dear brothers and sisters, that is how other religions and religious books are heresies. That is why. Because that is man's idea of God. That is man's idea about God. The only God's idea about God is the 66 books spent by 40 different authors over a period of 15, 1600 years. But giving us one consistent supernatural message. And if we understand it, it comes out of outside, outside that dimension of space and time. It's just staggering, staggering, staggering. Psalm 22 opens with King David telling, Ehi, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He has no idea. It is like a first person speaking, hanging on the cross, first person speaking. He is prophesying what Messiah is going to speak on the cross about 900 years later. Isaiah 53, written almost about 700 years earlier, the description of the cross in such minute, finer details that it's just a staggering blows our mind. 
It's a book outside, outside the dimension of our space and time, dear brothers and sisters. That's the only book which God's idea of God, God chose to reveal himself. That is God's idea of God. Other things are all man's idea of God. We can have a carnal idea about heaven, about eternal life. But what does the Bible say? What is God's idea about eternal life? Not my idea, not anybody, no Bible scholar, Bible teacher, no Nobel laureates, nobody. No pastor, no preacher, nobody. But what is God's idea about eternal life? John 17, 3 is God's idea about eternal life. This is eternal life. This is life eternal that they may know thee, that they may know you. And thy son, Yeshua HaMashiach. That is eternal life. And we can only know him through this book which we are holding in our hand today. That's the only way he chose to reveal himself. That is God's idea of God. God's word is proven. It has a proven track record. Man's idea of God is not. That is why every religion. Every other ideas. Every whatever form. It is. It's all heresy and lies. From the pit of hell. That's what it is. So as King David says. Dear brothers and sisters. That he is, he only is my rock, my salvation. From him comes my salvation. It perhaps is a good exercise. As you read through the book of Psalms, if you have been reading, or if you start reading through the book of Psalms, your brothers and sisters, but whatever time you have, maybe if you can read one Psalm a day, or depending, of course, it depends on the length of the Psalm. If, if whatever time, if you can if you can dedicate about 20 minutes for reading the book of Psalms or 15 minutes, let's say 15 minutes. And that 15 minutes should be an undivided, undivided attention. Whenever we want to come to word of God, it's just not a devotional moment. We're done and then we just walk out. The word should transform me. That is the lesson of the parable of Sower. We don't want to be other three grounds. We want to be the fourth ground which bear fruit. And that just doesn't happen if we don't pay heed. If we don't have undivided attention. So if you can give that 15 minutes undivided attention. It will be a good exercise. Once again please do pray or work. Let the spirit of God guide you. To find those attributes. Those personal attributes of God. Which is told. Let's, let's take a quick look. What, what exactly the book of Psalms says. If we go through few of the Psalms and if we go through few of the Psalms that and we'll, we'll probably try to we'll probably try to leave this uh, leave this in the comment section once again for you to take a look dear brothers and sisters and but please please once again please do your own study this is not an exhaustive list this is this is just an example to say in different Psalms where the Psalmist says he's a shield for me Psalm 3 3 is my glory Psalm 3 3 he is the one who lifts up my head Psalm 3 3 he is the righteous God he is a just judge Psalm 7 11 he is my refuge 9 9 he is the portion of my inheritance and my cup 16 5 he is my strength Psalm 18, 1 and Psalm 18 is staggering it just has so many of those personal attributes then he says, Psalm 18, to the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my support. Psalm 18, 18, he is my shepherd. 20, of course, we know the shepherd. Psalm, 20, Psalm 23, 1, he is my life and my salvation. Psalm 27, 1, and on and on, on it goes. It has so many. And once again, the list goes on. But And we will definitely leave this list in the comment section. Please, once again, use that as a guideline. But... Please do your personal study, dear brothers and sisters. Go through one psalm. If it is, if time is your limiting factor, please go through one psalm. And whatever personal attribute, he is my glory. He is my strength. He is my shield. He is my rock. He is my salvation. Whatever personal attribute you're finding. If you would please have a spiral bound notebook. If you would please have a spiral bound notebook and if you would like to note it down, please, if, if you can do a color coding, like 
go with numbering that number one in Psalm 3 3 he is my glory in Psalm 3 3 he is my shield you can do a color coding with the, with the references please do make sure that you write down the references and it will be a good exercise that how do you think he is why do you say he is my shield the Bible says he is my, the King David says he is my shield. He is my rock. Why do you think he is your shield? What has he done? A good exercise will be to write down a few of those instances. To remember why this paperwork, dear brothers and sisters, because there are so many days, especially in these last days, last moments, we go through that valley of death and valley of doubts. Where it feels like that we have probably taken this thing way too seriously. We are probably delusional. We are probably hallucinating. We are probably hallucinating trying to live a holy life. Which is the command that be holy for he is holy. And that's nothing to do with us. That's the work of the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Perhaps we'll feel that it is delusional. I don't look around and see that. So was Noah. Nobody else was building the march. The population can be calculated. Archaeologists say somewhere between 2.5 to 3 billion at that point of time. Can we do the percentage and see? Eight people. As a matter of fact, if we, if we include Enoch, it will be 8 plus 1. Nine people out of 2.5, 3 billion. Can we imagine the percentage there? Today when we look around, when we say that, well, if I try to live holy because God said be holy for he is holy, which is basically a work, once again, of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The sanctification work of the indwelling Holy Spirit, it doesn't look around like that. Prophets and Christians, believers, wherever we see, it doesn't look like that. So it will feel like I'm doing the wrong thing, dear brothers and sisters. That's not what Noah felt. Because that's why there will be days when we feel it's delusional. There will be day, days when we are in our lowest points. That is when we will go back to that notebook, the spiral bound notebook where we date and we can do that date and timestamp. And once again, we previously talked about the bud God moments as well. So we will revisit those journals. We will revisit this attributes of God personally the tangible attributes of God in my life let's say if we if we for lack of any better term we are labeling it as that but if the Lord leads you to put a better better terminology for this journal please do go for it but when we revisit no he is my rock he is my shelter he is my strength no matter what the enemy tells me today I am going to trust and stand on God's word and not on my feelings, not on my circumstances and situations and my relationships and my friends and my family and my surroundings and my job and my colleagues are not going to define me, but God's word is going to define me. I am not going to trust anybody except Lord Jesus Christ, my rock, my shelter, my redeemer, my savior, Yeshua Hamashiach. And that determination only comes when we go back to look at the spiral bound journal written in pen, in ink, not in pencil, but ink. When we look back that personally how he has been holding our hands and walking us through. And that is a staggering exercise once again in the school of faith, dear brothers and sisters. That is a staggering exercise once again in these end moments. In the school of faith to trust, to overcome our unbelief and trust in God. That is a staggering exercise. That is a staggering resource which we will be building up. And not necessarily we have to share this with anybody. If the Lord doesn't lead you, you don't have to share it with anybody. That's just your personal me and my Messiah thing. And do what God and see what God does. See what God does. He is faithful. He is faithful beyond our imagination. But dear brothers and sisters, we need to be systematic. We need to be organized because we are at war. Every microsecond, every femto picosecond. There's a contest. There's a battle going on. There's a battle going on. Now that 
Satan knows that his plan A, that he was stopping us from the saving knowledge of God. Now the plan A did not work. So he has now started implementing plan B every second through whatever means and modes he cho chooses to. And what is that plan B? That he will keep us from the rewards and inheritance which God has for us. God has a plan for each one of us, dear brothers and sisters. Noah was not just saved to float in the boat. No, he wasn't. We need to think about what the scripture tells us. Noah was not saved to float in the boat, but God had a purpose. Messiah's genealogy comes from Noah only. Noah had a purpose, a staggering purpose. So yes, dear brothers and sisters, if the Lord leads you, please do go for it. The personal attribute of Messiah has been revealed in your personal life. Please do go for it. Please make it as fancy color coding as possible so that it keeps you interested and involved, I guess. And let the Spirit of God speak to your heart. That's what is very crucial. And then King David says, verse 3, he says, do not now, it's something staggering going on. Now King David is basically, he's talking about something staggering. Excuse me. So it's, it's a direct challenge. Excuse me. I was on the other page. But Psalm 62 was 3. Psalm 62 was 3. He says, now it's a challenge, a direct challenge to the wicked. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain. All of you, a direct challenge to the wicked. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you. He is ministering his soul by rebuking his enemies like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. The only, they only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight. This is a description of the ways of wicked now. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. This is a description of the wicked, dear brothers and sisters. So he says, how long will you attack a man? So King David's faith was in God alone, but he also rebuked his enemy, enemies who persistently attacked him and warned them of judgment to come. You shall be slain, King David is telling. And these are not fleshly enemies. Once again, this is not because of a doctrinal dispute. This is not because of some fleshly things which we don't agree, dis, which we don't agree upon. Because of, some, because of some fleshly dispute or disagreement. No, these are not fleshly enemies. Depending on whom we like or not. Or who agrees with us or not. But those here, these are the enemies of the cross. These are the enemies of the cross King David is talking about. When we look at the cross, we should understand one thing, dear brothers and sisters. How much God hates sin and loves the sinners. We get it other way around. We love the sin and hate the sinners. That's not what King David is talking about. He's talking about enemies of the cross. They are wicked. They distort the word of God. They don't want to be doers of the word. They don't want to be obedient as Lord Jesus Christ has that plan ordained. The enemies of the cross who are putting Lord Jesus Christ to open shame every single day. By misrepresenting him and his word. That's what King David is talking about. And then he says something staggering. What are the ways? They delight in lies, ways of the wicked. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. As a matter of fact, that reminds me of the book of James. Let's, let's turn a little to the right. A few pages. Let's take a look at book of James, chapter 3. Let's do the first few verses, book of James, chapter 3. Just the first few verses. James also ref refers to the same thing. Let's pick it up around verse 3, where, where he gives two staggering metaphors, two staggering figures of speech, and then he gets into what exactly he's talking. So James says, and this is James chapter 3, verse 3. Let's, let's go through this together. Once again, let the Spirit of God speak to our hearts, dear brothers and sisters. So 
James says, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and man has been and has been excuse me and has been tamed by mankind but no man can tame the tongue it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison have we been paying heed to that with it we bless our god and father and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of god out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and, a, and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevine bear figs? Does no spring yields both salt water and fresh? That's something, dear brothers and sisters, we want to really pay heed to. These are the last moments. And that's the way of wicked which the psalmist is describing. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Are we going to trust God's word? Or are we going to fall for all the form of godliness, all the different ways of fleshly deception? That's something, dear brothers and sisters, that is spiritual discernment. That is what is spiritual discernment. The Spirit of God tells us what it is. When it does not align with the Word of God, what I'm hearing, what, but just has not the whole counsel of God we are talking about here. When Peter says, oh, it was only told in Torah to be holy. No, Peter is telling us be holy for he is holy. Peter is 1 Peter 2 24 tells us that Messiah died on the cross so that we can live unto right, righteousness. We can live a righteous life because Lord Jesus Christ empowers us to do so. That's not of our flesh that anyone can boast. That's not of our flesh. Ephesians 2 8 and 10. There are two works sold about. We are not saved by works so that anyone can boast, but we are saved unto. We are his workmanship, saved unto good works which has been preordained and we must walk in them. Those good works. There are two works we are talking about, bad and good. One is the works in our flesh and one is the God ordained work which God has begun a good work in each one of us. Philippians 1 6 tells us. So when we see once again, spiritual discernment is our whole counsel of God only. Whole counsel of God will only give us the spiritual discernment. If we see once again, let's say comp complicated machines, let's say an airplane drive. The airplane has different, different machines of all the different controls, different meters of control. If he is focusing, there are six or seven different kind of meters to to. Make sure that the, that the flight, the airplane is properly functioning. But if our eyes, if the eyes of the pilot is just fixed on one meter, let's say just the speedometer or whatever that is called, that then he will miss all those blind spots. He's setting himself up to a serious accident, a serious something which he... Is setting himself up to. Same is true. And that's once again a very clumsy example. Dear brothers and sisters. But hopefully we can put the point across. That when we don't have the whole counsel of God. When we just are looking at here and there. Which gratifies our flesh. When we are not running away from flesh. When we read the Bible. When we are when we are reading the Bible. We are totally gratifying our flesh. That's, that's not what the Bible is meant to. The Bible is meant to transform us. How do we get transformed? Bit by bit, our flesh is chipped. 
That's the sanctification work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's why 1 Peter 1.23 tells us that the word, through the word of God, we are born again. That's the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The word of God cleanses us by the washing. Through the word of God cleanses us. That's the sanctification work bit by bit. We are chipped of all those fleshly desires. To gratify our flesh. That is God's work through and through. When we are reading the Bible. It is just a daily devotional. Staying in the world. Doing every form of fleshly gratification. Whatsoever it is. And justifying it. And telling to know. Be holy for he is holy. Those are not possible and all the things. Then we know that we have. We are setting ourselves to a deception. And if we hear such thing. We know that we are. In the wrong place. A red flag. And we need to pray about it dear brothers and sisters. So they delight in lies. They bless with their mouth. But they curse inwardly. And then King David continues says. My soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. Isn't that staggering? If we truly understand what that means dear brothers and sisters. So many problems will be sorted in our life. Truly. My soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. Our repeat King David says my expectation is from him. Why do we get hurt? Because we expect, right? We expect from our best friend, from whoever, our family member, our best friend, our colleague, or whosoever. We expect that, or whosoever it is, that expectation should be from God and He will never, ever leave us. He will never, ever forsake us. He will do the best. Sometimes we pray something about something in our flesh. We think that is necessary, but God knows the best. He is protecting us. He is saving us. And when we look back in our high school days, there are so many prayers, which today, today we will be, we are thankful, aren't we, dear brothers and sisters, that he did not answer? Aren't we thankful? Can't we, can we not look back and say that, well, I'm so thankful during my high school days, God did not answer that prayer. Otherwise, today, this wouldn't have been possible. God always has the best. He sometimes might say, wait. Sometimes he says no, because that's something which is coming from our flesh, a thought which the enemy perhaps has implanted in our head, and we want that. But God, then he transforms us. But if our expectation is from him and him alone, if we are silently waiting for God alone, so many of our betrayals, heartbreaks, so many of those darkest moments, so many of those will be gone. Isn't it, dear brothers and sisters? As the psalmist says in the opening lines of the psalm, King David says that his that his was that that was the state of his soul. What was the state of his soul? What did he start with? My soul silently waits for God. This is the state of his soul. Silently his, way, his soul is waiting for God. Today we don't even understand what is silent and what is waiting. Both of them are missing. Why? If we realize that's the tech savvy world has done to us. That's the smartphones which has done to us. How long? Let's, let's challenge ourselves, dear brothers and sisters. Now, how long can I put my smartphone away or my whatever gadget I'm using away? All the software, all the di digital products. How long can I put it away and truly un with undivided attention have a hard copy of the Bible and focus on God? How long? That doesn't make us holy. This is not a test for holiness or righteousness. Once again, let the enemy not take away the message. The message is, when we do that, dear brothers and sisters, we will be drawn nearer to God. Ephesians 2.2, 2, have we ever paid heed to that? The prince of the power of the air. 
when we read the parable of sower, who are the birds of the air once again? And the parable that tells us the birds of the air. The birds of the air is who? Satan. And ministers of Satan. And once again, the, the theologians and have a very fancy term telling us expositional constancy. Expositional constancy is when we use, when a particular Id idiom is used. It is constant all across the scriptures. So birds represent Satan or his ministers. The prince of the power of the air, who is that? Satan, the enemy, the accuser of brethren, the one who wants to destroy, the destroyer of our soul. What does all these internet and all the, all the television and all these things, what does it work on again? Now we see all the different, today we see, it's just staggering times we live in. Today we see the fallenness, the fallenness, how fallen things are. As we look around, dear brothers and sisters, God has delivered us and I stand speechless. And once again, please don't get us wrong. This is nothing to do with us. But I stand speechless that God has delivered us from all that evil, evil things around, evil things of the world and all those evil lies of the devil. There is, there is not a day which goes by, dear brothers and sisters, there is not a day which goes by. When I don't stop to thank God what he has done. What he has done in my life and my family's life. We serve a great, great God, dear brothers and sisters. Let's not limit him. Let's not go to him and say, God, I need this. Please give me this. God might have a better plan. God might have a better plan. We don't know, dear brothers and sisters. Give him a chance to work in your life. See how glorious life, life will be. You may not like it at that point of time when things are happening. But it will be glorious. It will be glorious. When we, that is the challenge. Coming back, that is the challenge, dear brothers and sisters. To take away all our gadgets, all our digital products, all smartphone, everything. And sit with the hard copy of the Bible, a notepad and pen. When we have our undivided attention, dear brothers and sisters, if we go to Song of Solomon, or excuse me, Song of Solomon, I meant. I apologize for that. My tongue is tied, dear brothers and sisters. Song of Solomon. When we go to Song of Solomon, what we see, that one look, what happens? His heart ravishes. His heart ravishes one look and you got him dear brothers and sisters one look one undivided attention and we got him one look all it takes is that one look he's waiting that undivided attention one look from us and his heart ravishes you got him you got him go for it today dear brothers and sisters that one look that undivided attention my soul waits silently for God alone. He will teach us to wait. He will teach us the science. That's what King David says in the opening line. And now here he spoke to his soul. Telling it to remain in that place of trust. To trust in and surrender to God. King David's complete expectation was upon God. Is it for us today? We live in a strange, strange, strange world, dear brothers and sisters. We live in a very, very strange world. We look for now, everything is covered with insurance. We have health insurance. We have home insurance. We have auto insurance, the car insurance. Auto insurance. We have, now we are all covered with Different kinds of insurance. And we have started thinking that now we need a fire insurance as well. Hellfire insurance. That's what is salvation. That's what enemy has started 
playing that in our minds. That's not what it is. Salvation is not a hellfire insurance. Salvation is not a one-time event. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation belongs to God. And God alone, Psalm 3, this Psalm as well, tells us all across the Psalm we see that. All across the Old and New Testament we see that. We know where we see that we just slip out of line in the church, lift, lift up our hands, say one time prayer, and we are good. We have this hellfire insurance. We are, we think we have that assurance because we try to equate it with, well, I have this home insurance and I have this auto insurance. I have this health insurance. So I have this fire insurance. So what is wrong in it? We are deceived. We are deceived, dear brothers and sisters, if anyone listening to us, if anyone listening to us, if that's you, we beseech you, we beseech you, our dear fellow brethren, please, please once again, get to your prayer closet. Let the Spirit of God speak to your heart. Let Messiah show you the reality. Please do not trust in me or anybody else. Let Yeshua HaMashiach, to whom belongs salvation, let him show to you what is the truth. That is the strange world we live in where we cannot say that our complete expectation is upon God. From my, for my expectation is from Him and Him alone because we have so many avenues. So many different things going on. The distractions are put in our path for a reason, dear brothers and sisters, by the enemy. But God will use it for His glory. Why? Because every time Every time we take our thought captive using the imperative of 2 Corinthians 10, 5 with those distractions. Every time there is celebration in heaven, there is rejoicing because one more distraction is knocked off. One more battle is won. Satan is defeated in one more of his contest. To make you and me lose our rewards. King David urges on now urges on himself the silence which is simply stated in verse 1 and he says for God alone they who trust not God at all they trust not God at all who trust him not alone I repeat they trust not God at all who trust him not alone if we don't trust him alone if we have plan A, B, C, D, E, F going on, we need to today revisit. And once again, dear brothers and sisters, this is not a message of condemnation. This is a message once again of conviction. If we have problems with unbelief, that is where, once again, we, the good news is what? When we go to the fruit of the Spirit, once again, we, from the fruit of the Spirit, we, the, the fruit of Ruach HaKodesh, we, all understand from our Sunday school we sang songs and things alike but when we truly dwell on it love joy peace patience so we saw patience comes from God and God alone when we abide in him we bear much fruit so we just need to abide patience is God will impart that to us give that to us then we as we go along the list love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness faithfulness trust that's a fruit as well that's a fruit as well dear brothers and sisters trusting God when we abide in him God empowers us to trust in his promises when we abide in him that's the key dear brothers and sisters and once again we cannot emphasize enough that doing a word study and abide will be a good starting point to understand because Impatience and unbelief, dear brothers and sisters, we truly believe is what we are going to fight the most apart from the deception and everything with the end time deception, whatever is going on. But impatience and unbelief, which is in us, in our flesh, is something which we will be a constant battle in the days that remain, dear brothers and sisters, especially as we see everything speeding up. The day of redemption, or the day of rapture is upon us. The enemy knows his time is short. He will do everything 
everything possible to make our lives miserable. But dear brothers and sisters, we are more than conquerors in Messiah. But only when we are in Messiah, not looking for logical reasoning. As important as, once again, we repeat, as important as those news, what we are reading, what we are listening, what we are looking are. But they are, we, what, what does the scripture define as prophecy? The spirit of Lord Jesus Christ, whatever we are doing, if those news, whatever we are reading, as important as they can be, if it is not leading me back to Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, then it is of no use. It is of no use. It's just an adrenaline rush. It's just a play on adrenaline, nor adrenaline. It's just a walk on the catecholomy, it's the hormones. We don't want to be a victim of that, dear brothers and sisters. That's why we want to pray, pray, pray harder so that God can transform us. And only way we can be transformed is through God's word. We really need to put our face in the book and not in Facebook. We need to put our face, our personal face, face in this book. The book which we are holding now, the Holy Bible. That will transform us in the days that remain, dear brothers and sisters. For God alone, they, once again, King David trusted in God alone. He that stands with one foot on a rock and another foot upon a quicksand will sink and perish. As certainly as that he stands with both feet upon a quicksand. What does, as a matter of fact, once again, if you would please, you know, together turn to the book of James. Let's take a look. James chapter 1. What does James say about being double-minded? James chapter 1, I believe we'll pick it up, verse 5. Let's, let's go through verses 5 through 8. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, that's a staggering challenge there. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Today, if we want godly wisdom, and that is one of our prayer, dear brothers and sisters, for since 2015 with Messiah, Messiah, since Messiah's visitation for a wretch like me, since that day Messiah has put in our hearts for me and my family, we claim on James 1 5 every single day to pray, dear brothers and sisters. And that's once again, we are one. Please don't get us wrong. We are all work in progress. We are just sharing what Messiah shares with us, dear brothers and sisters. That we pray that if any one of us lack godly wisdom, he will give us freely. And that godly wisdom will help us to discern. And understand the deception, whatever it is, dear brothers and sisters. He shall know the truth. We can only know the truth through God's wisdom. And the truth shall make you free. And if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. But we need to know the truth. To know the truth, once again, we need God's wisdom and God's word. So James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. It's an open challenge. Who gives to all liberally without reproach? And it will be given to him. And then there is a condition. He puts a small condition. In fine, it is not in fine print. Like we see in our world. But it is all out there. In clear print. In which letters. Which we can read. But he, there is that. But let him as in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. When we are doubting, dear brothers and sisters, we can go and ask, Help me, Lord, overcome my unbelief. I want to believe. Help me, Lord, overcome my unbelief. That's, a, that's the prayer. That was the prayer of the broken father. That was his prayer. Messiah did not condemn him. But when we are doubting having plan A, B, C, D, E, F before, oh, we have that plan J on the side. But we have plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I before that. All the different nine plans going on. And we have plan J, which is plan Jesus on the side. Dear yeah, brothers and sisters, once again, I'm being facetious, but that's how God feels. That's how he gets disheartened when we don't trust in him because that's his question. He understands our flesh is weak. That's why he says the flesh is weak to Peter. Oh, Peter. Oh, Peter, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. 
He understands our weakness, dear brothers and sisters. He understands it truly. We can take it to him, our weakness, but when we knowingly have ten different plans, Messiah being one of that, that disheartens him, that saddens his heart. Every day that should be our prayer. Lord help me overcome my unbelief. Because every day that is the question dear brothers and sisters put forth in front of you and me that my son, my daughter, do you trust today that I'll come true? And trusting once again, let's not get it confused today. We walk by faith or sight. Today's world with smartphone technology and all kinds of whatever, whatever we want to call it, Celestial events, signs, wonders, gematria, numerology, logical reasoning, inductive, deductive reasoning, and whatsoever it be. It has all boiled down to tangibility. It's like telling me, well, today you need to win me over God. You need to convince me that it's going to happen, that you are going to provide, you're going to you are going to make this work. You are going to strengthen me. You are going to empower me. Win me over. Show me proof. Show me this. Show me that. We talk about show, show and show today. But the Bible says we walk by faith. And the Hebrews 11 defines for us that faith is 0% evidence. And 100% hope. I repeat Hebrews 11.1 1 defines for us. Faith is 0% evidence and 100%, 100% hope. But today we go and say, Lord, show me this, show me that. Is that true? And once again, dear brothers and sisters, yes, God can show. I'm not telling it is not. It's truly once again, experientially he does. But that is once again, it should bring us back. The spirit of prophecy is Jesus Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach is the spirit of prophecy. It should bring us back. Anything prophetic should bring us back to Lord Jesus Christ. Because let's, let's take a quick look what Paul says. I believe that's Romans 8.24. Romans 8.24. Let's take a quick look. Romans 8.24 says, For we were saved in this hope, but that but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? If every day I want to see God needs to show me this, show me that, then what is that hope? This is God's word, dear brothers and sisters. Romans 8, 24, let's read that together. Once again, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Today it might be a common thing because we think, that is how the professing Christians we see. We re truly don't have to jump in that bandwagon. The journey to the cross is lonely. We have to stick to what the word of God says. The whole counsel of God says dear brothers and sisters. Walk by faith is not walk by sight. It's either or it's not 50% of this, 50% of that, half and half. No it is not. It's on both ends of the spectrum. Let's understand that. We either walk by sight or either walk by faith. Faith is 0% evidence, 100% hope. And Paul tells us what? For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? That's the question. If God shows me every day and if we are pushing him, win me over, show me, what is that hope? And when we Try, dear brothers and sisters, and give as God help me, Lord. I'm having problem with believing. I don't know how things will get better. I don't know how this problem is going to be sorted out. I don't know for whether it is for provision, whether it is whatsoever, whether it is for protection, whatsoever it is, or some other promises which God word says, whatsoever it is. Let's wait on him. Let's pray, Lord. Give me the strength to wait upon you, Lord. And in the meantime, let's keep telling he only is my rock and my salvation.
That's what King David says. In, in verse 6 he says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Staggering, staggering. King David assured himself once again by repeating lines from Psalm 62 too. He is my defense. He is not my defender only, but my actual protection. And that is why I shall not be moved. King David once again repeated the idea from verse 2. Telling, but with the, with the small variation here, he says in verse 2, he wrote, I shall not be greatly moved. Now he's telling in this verse, he seems to now come to an even stronger position telling, I shall not be moved. And there may be once again be deep meaning in this slight omission of greatly in the second refrain showing that that confidence in Lord. I shall not be moved because he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense and I shall not be moved. With that confidence will face the enemy head on. And we will be victorious every time dear brothers and sisters. The enemy attacks us with unbelief. Mistrusting God, distrusting God, and impatience. And then King David says what? My refuge and my refuge is in God. Here once again, the important thing to notice dear brothers and sisters is the emphasis once again reflects that King, reflects King David's decision to trust in nothing or no one else. God alone is his salvation, his glory, his rock, his strength, and his refuge. We sense that King David was perhaps tempted to trust many different things. But he refused and kept his expectation in God and God alone. You let us observe how. King David, the psalmist, brands his own initials upon every name which he is rejoicingly give, rejoicingly gives to his God. The emphasis of that of that personal relationship with Lord Jesus Christ, which is the primary primary factor. My expectation, my rock, my salvation, my glory, my strength, my refuge, my Lord. Today we are. There are being battles fought over, talked about all these different kinds of things, heresies being propagated, whatever it is, this shepherdship, lordship, salvation, and things like that. If he is not my Lord, then who is he? He is Lord, but is he my Lord? Why is it then if he is he my rock? Or is it again rock ship? Rock ship salvation it will become. My strength, it is no, it is strength ship salvation. My refuge, no, it is refuge ship salvation. And once again, I'm being facetious, dear brothers and sisters, but hopefully we can put the point across, dear brothers and sisters. Let the Spirit of God speak to your heart. Let the Word of God once again teach you the truth, dear brothers and sisters. Not this child, not me, not Anna, David, nobody. No Bible scholar, teacher, nobody but the one true living God. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of the one true living God. As long as we cannot say my expectation, my rock, my salvation, my glory, my strength, my refuge, and on goes the list. We will be deceived by the enemy. We will be struggling. We will be walking by sight. We will be relying on that knowledge of the good and evil. We will be consuming more and more and more and more and more and more and more. Of that forbidden fruit, bite by bite, bite by bite, bite by bite, bite by bite, we will keep nibbling on it. If he is not my expectation, if he is not my rock, if he is not my salvation, if he is not my glory, my strength, my refuge, we will be consumed by that knowledge of good and evil. We will never be set free, dear brothers and sisters. And that's what the enemy wants. Because here King David is not content to know that the Lord is all these things. He is not content to know that he is Lord. He is not content to know that he is rock. He is salvation. He is glory. He is strength. He is refuge. But now he personal, personal. He has this personal relationship. He personalizes it. 
Because he knows him personally. Because he meets him every day in the prayer closet. Because he shares, King David shares his heart and God also shares his heart with King David. Because this is the man after God's own heart as the scripture says. Today he is willing to do that with you and me dear brothers and sisters. But are we willing to set aside once again all the gadgets, all the digital products, just a hard copy of the Bible, notepad and pen. Can we spend, give that undivided attention? And one glance, his heart ravishes, you got him. One undivided attention, you got him. That's what the scripture teaches us, dear brothers and sisters. King David is interested in pursuing a deep personal relationship. An intimate relationship with Lord Jesus Christ. Not only as a doctrine and knowledge. Not only as head knowledge, but truly he wants to pursue a deep, intimate, personal relationship with Lord Jesus Christ. Are we looking for that today? Are we truly looking for that today? That's the question, dear brothers and sisters. But moving on to verse 8, King David says, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. We can keep reading this over and over and over again. Maybe it's time, dear brothers and sisters, to take a print out of it, to stick it on, to stick it on our fridge, our fridge to stick, stick it up on our, on our restroom mirror, wherever, in our workplace, in our bedroom, wherever, dear brothers and sisters. Because it will remind us that we need to trust in him at all times, whether I understand it or not, whether I feel it or whether I do not feel it. Whether I see it or I don't see it. Whether it makes sense or it doesn't. Whether it's logical or illogical. I need to trust in him at all times. That's what King David is telling. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. God is a refuge for us. Today is the day, dear brothers and sisters. Today is the day to trust, to trust in him. King David felt what was good for him was good for others also. That's why he's telling as a leader of God's people, he's telling to speak. Trust God at all times. At all times. Not sometimes. Not many times. Not most of the times. Not when we feel like. But at all times. Good or bad. Let's trust in Him. There should be certain baseline, dear brothers and sisters, in our relationship with Lord Jesus Christ. He is good all the God is good all the time. Whether I feel it in my flesh or not, He is good. I will trust in Him at all times. No matter whether it's mountaintop or my valley, whether it's a valley of death or valley of doubt, I will trust in him at all times. There are certain baselines and which we need to pray for every single day. These are not determination which we make and we can carry through. This is the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit, which empowers, he empowers us every day. That is the key, dear brothers and sisters. Pour out your heart. Pour out your heart before him. Have you been? Did you get a chance to talk to him today? This week? This month? Lately? A heart to heart conversation. As you will have with your best friend. As we will have with our best friend. Or with our closest friend or whosoever it is. We like to talk to our best friend or our closest friend, but we cannot go and talk to God. Why is it so, dear brothers and sisters? Why is it so? Do we truly believe the garden tomb is empty? Do we truly believe he is alive? Do we truly believe that he is listening to me? He is listening to us. Do we truly believe that? And if we do believe, then why does our action not show? Why do we need so many plan A, B, C, D, E, F? Why don't we just run to the prayer closet? 
Just have an honest conversation, heart to heart conversation. Lord, I messed up. Help me, Lord. I don't know what to do. Not the last thing, but should be the first thing and the only thing. That's what God is telling you, brothers and sisters. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be extremely, extremely difficult. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be extremely difficult, yes. But where are our eyes set on today? It's a direct challenge. Direct challenge to every follower, true follower of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Lord Jesus Christ, of our Messiah. That trust in Him at all times, trust in me, and pour out your heart. God is a refuge for us. He will give us that refuge. He will provide for us. He will protect us. He will help us. He will strengthen us. That's the key to understand here, brothers and sisters. When we, let's take a small detour. Now today we are running a little over time, but let's take a small detour, dear brothers and sisters. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 2, a few verses. Let's, let's read just first few verses. Let's pick it up around verse 5, verse 4, let's say. Let's pick it up. Jeremiah chapter 2, let's pick it up around verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what injustice have your fathers found in me? That they have gone far from me, have followed idols. And have become idolaters. Neither did they say where is the Lord. Who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Who led us through the wilderness. Through a land of deserts and pits. Through a land of drought and shadow of doubt. Through a land that no one crossed. And where no one dwelt. I brought you into a bountiful country. To eat its fruit and its goodness. When you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Are we seeking the living, one true living God? Or are we just going to that building church and happy with clapping and coming back every Sunday? And depending on which side of the globe we are, on perhaps one day, one evening in the week. Are we happy with that? Or do we want to know the owner of the house? The priest did not say where is the Lord, verse 8. And those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal. And walked up to things that do not profit. Today do we see this unfolding right in front of our eyes, dear brothers and sisters. So highly unfortunate, so highly unfortunate. We need to really, really pray, dear brothers and sisters. Spend time in our prayer closet. They used to call James as the camel knee because he spent his time on his knees. Are we? Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, Lord says. Continuing in verse 9, says the Lord. And against your children's children, I will bring charges. For pass beyond the coast of Cyprus and see, send to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods, but my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. Why? For my people have committed two evils. What is that? They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn for themselves systems, broken systems that hold, that can hold no water. Is that a reality today we see unfolding? Is that me? Is that us? Is that you, dear brothers and sisters? Once again, please don't get us wrong. This is not about condemnation. If there is any way, if there is any way, once, let's seek him while he is found. If there is any way that we have trusted in our friend, in our strength or whatsoever, more than God. Today is the day to repent. Today is the day to turn back. Today is the day to come to him. Today is the day to spend the time all, the, all night long to cry and let those tears roll down. Blessed are those who mourn, mourn for their sins, for they shall be comforted by the comforter, Ruach HaKodesh. When was the last time?
time we wept for our sins? That's the question. That's the question today. Today is the day come to him. Pour out your hearts and see what God has. Because God is a refuge for us. He welcomes the poured out heart as the cities of refuge welcomed the hunted man in ancient Israel. And then King David continues. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Surely men of low degree are a vapor, men of high degree are a lie. This sound speaks much of trusting in God and God alone. That should be our take home message today, dear brothers and sisters. Now, King David explained why it was important to not set trust in men. Why? Because King David understood that whether they are men of low degree or high degree, they are altogether lighter than vapor. There is no substance there worthy of trust. Common men can give no help. They are vanity and it is folly to trust in them. For although they may be willing, yet they have no ability to help you. Rich men are a lie. King David says they promise much but perform nothing. They cause you to hope but mock at your expectation. That's what King David is telling. There is no hope in man. And what does the report card say? Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 5 through 8 is staggering. 5 and 6 gives us the report card of trusting in man. In our flesh. And verses 7 and 8 gives us the report card of trusting in God. Let's take a quick look. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 5 and 6. First we'll take a, report, take a look at the report card of trusting in our own flesh or man. He says, God says what? Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see good. When and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. How terrible it is. Now let's see the staggering report card of trusting God, whether we understand him or not, whether we see it or not, whether it's logical or illogical, when we trust in him, just trusting in him, without seeing that is, we walk by sight, not we don't, excuse me, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith, right? That is 100% hope and 0% evidence. When we are only walking by faith, when we are only walking by 100% hope, what is the report card? Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. So trust and hope, what do we see? 100% hope. 0% evidence, 0% sight, 100% faith. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. He's not hoping in the Lord, his hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. When we trust in God and God alone, 0%, 0% evidence, 100% hope, 0% sight, 100% faith, then we will be always yielding fruit because Jeremiah 17, 8 says that, nor will cease from yielding fruit. That's a key to understand. And bearing fruit brings glory to our heavenly father. John 15, 8. The true wine in the branches discourse tells us, Messiah tells us that. There is no hope in man, dear brothers and sisters. Let's pray harder. Let's hold hands and pray for each other so that in the days that remain, we can truly trust in him and him alone. And once again, if you have any prayer requests, please, dear brothers and sisters, please don't hesitate to contact us and our description in the description box or contact 
information will be there. Our comment section is open and we are truly and indeed praying for each and every single of our fellow brethren who have asked for prayers, dear brothers and sisters, so that Messiah's mighty will and only his perfect will be accomplished in each one of you. May he once again transform you with every passing day through his inerrant and infallible word. May you be transformed to his mighty image by the sanctification work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. As you, as we all yield to the Spirit of God. That's what it is all about. And then King David says, do not trust in oppression nor vainly hope in robbery. So King David had seen men advance through cruel or dishonest ways. He warned the people against this, understanding that the results never justify evil used to get the results. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. So as a king, King David ended up for perhaps being a very, very wealthy man. Lots of riches, though most of his early years were perhaps in deep poverty as a shepherd boy. But King David knew what it was to see riches increase. And he knew the foolishness of settings, setting one's heart on them. It's perhaps it's possible, perhaps it's possible to hold great wealth without trusting in those riches. But it isn't, isn't going to be easy unless... Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ alone is our rock, experientially. Because we see in the parable of sore what? The rich, riches and deceit of the world, deceit of riches, choke the word of God. So there are perhaps at least three ways in, in which one may set the heart on riches. To take excessive pleasure in riches, making them source of joy for life. To place one's hope and security in riches. Or to grow proud and arrogant because of riches. But whether rightly or wrongly won, they are wrongly used if they are trusted in. Dear brothers and sisters, let's always remember. It's not about man or money or man. It's about Messiah. We get tend to get Confused because the enemy confuses us in our flesh. We tend to have all the logic, the knowledge of good and evil makes us feel that money and man we try to tend to rely on and not on Messiah. But the fact is money and man are mutable. Only Messiah is immutable. I repeat, money and man if we trust on them, they are mutable. But only Messiah is immutable. He can be trusted at all times. Without a shadow of doubt, hands down, we can trust him today. He has the best interest for us. He demonstrated that on that wooden cross. We all are the beneficiaries of the love story. Written in the blood of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. On that wooden cross which was erected in Calvary some 2,000 years ago. We all are the beneficiaries of that love story. Written in his precious, priceless, holy blood. He can be trusted not only today, not only tomorrow, not only a week for a week from now, not only a month from now, but forever, forever he can be trusted. Yes, dear brothers and sisters, forever he can be trusted. And King David says, now ends the psalm telling, God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you render to each one according to his work. So God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. This truth was deeply ingrained in King David's soul. Is it for us? Because the enemy, all we do is run after power. When we get little power, we start controlling the controlling the truths, whether it be as whatsoever role it is, whether it's as a, as as a as a boss, as a manager in our job, as as a, whatever, as a mentor, as whoever, as a guide, as parents as well, whoever, whosoever. When we get a little power, we start misutilizing it and try to boss around. Messiah did not do that. Silent. Silent he stood. 
on that day. He had all the power, but silent he stood, bowing down to our Heavenly Father's will. Silent he stood, beaten, mocked, spat upon, accused, flogged. He took every single, the crown of thorns, every single shame and spitting, everything. Silent he stood. Because he knew if he opened his mouth, you and me will be rotting in hell. This world makes each and every human flesh power him hungry. The knowledge of good and evil does not do any good to anybody. Every day we nibble on that fruit bit by bit, bit by bit, bit by bit. Because whenever we don't choose to trust God and ask him to show, show, show. And please don't get us wrong once again. Messiah will show when according to his sovereign will. The truth. God has spoken once, twice. I have heard this. The power belongs to God. This truth was deeply ingrained in King David's soul. Through repetition, he understood that power belongs to God and to none other. And this is why King David was so determined to trust in God and God alone. No one has the power to protect, to save, to defend, to do anything to anybody. Since power belongs to God, King David refused to look for strength anywhere else. Since power belongs to God, King David did not long for power unto himself. Since power belongs to God, King David did not become arrogant as a ruler, knowing any power he held was as God's representative. That's a lesson for each one of us today, dear brothers and sisters. Also to you that he says, O Lord belongs mercy. Moreover, as we see now, King David understood that God's nature was much more than power. He also is rich in mercy. Just as men could and should look to God for power, so they should look to him for mercy and here the word mercy as a matter of fact translates one of the great words of the Old Testament hest it may perhaps be be better translated in our English as as love as as loving kindness or loyal love King David knew that power belongs to God but that God is a God of love who is loyal and good to his people that should be our foundational Statement every single minute of our lives, every if necessary, every single femtosecond, we should speak to our soul. Like King David was preaching his soul in the wilderness. Oh soul, why are you so downcast? Hope in God. This should be a foundational statement once again, dear brothers and sisters. That God is a God of love who is loyal and good to his people at all times. This word mercy it is closely linked with the, the, the covenant keeping. Hence, hence this the modern translations we see it says as steadfast love or true love because it's linked with the covenant keeping. King David here in essence is telling us that he has learned two lessons. What? That God is strong and that God is loving. What does that mean? This meant that King David had no expectation of mercy from man. Mercy comes from Messiah, not man. Man is mutable. Messiah is immutable. Mercy comes from God and God alone. Mercy, mercy is always from Messiah, not from man. That's what King David understood. If it came from man, he was pleased, but he knew that. Ultimately, the great covenant love, the mercy belonged to God. And then he ends with telling, for you render to each one according to his work. So when we understand this statement once again, we tend to think, how do we tend to think? We think it as of something, uh, a negative notion, don't we? And as a matter of fact, it, of course, it has, that is, one school of thought, good scholars say that because it is Paul has the same idea when Paul is telling 
before he is talking about this, the description of the rewards. And I believe that's 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He's talking about that now he that planted and he that watereth are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. When Paul is talking about and that's one thought which that good scholars think which is the psalmist King David is telling us. But also we don't normally think of this expression that for you render to each one according to his work as God's mercy. In some ways, of course, it sounds more like God's judgment. Yes, but then yet King David, perhaps there is another school of thought telling that King David perhaps had in mind the good man or woman whose goodness is despised by this world. That the God of mercy would reward their goodness. Even if it is on a relative measure or as the world ignored or rejected it, God will reward their goodness. So every effort in Lord is never in vain, dear brothers and sisters. It doesn't have to be always in the forefront. God, we have called you to silently pray for somebody or some ministry or whatever. God knows that that's between you and God. He is watching that. He is the overseer of our soul. He is watching. He will reward you. On our part, we need to be diligent. That's what is the call. Everybody does not have the same gift. Everybody is given different gifts to edify. It's not everybody has to preach. Everybody has to put a message on social media. Everybody has to stand on the pulpit. If that is the case, then other things, who will do the other ministry? God is seeing everything and he will truly, truly reward each and every single Every single of his obedient servant. It's all going to be worth it, dear brothers and sisters. It's all going to be worth it on that day when we hold hands together, when he opens the book, when he talks about all the things, and when we talk about when he if he gives us a chance to talk about the miracles which he has done in each one of our lives, when it opens up, it will be jaw dropping in heaven. We will be totally prostrate. To understand what a mighty, what a mighty God we serve. Man can neither help us nor reward us. God will do both. So whom shall we seek today, dear brothers and sisters? King David, in essence, in the psalm, is telling us to really meditate on these two most interesting subjects. The power of God to punish Sin, that power belongs to God, he's telling. The power of God to punish sin and his mercy to pardon it. The fear of the former will instill the desire of the latter. I repeat. So King David is in essence telling us to really meditate on these two staggering topics. That the power, the power of God to punish sin and his mercy to pardon it. The fear, the fear of the former, the fear of that power of God to punish sin will instill, instill the desire in each one of us to have mercy, have mercy, have mercy, mercy, mercy on me, Lord. Because we all need mercy to survive every single day. And his mercy is on you every morning. Why is it new so that we can go and gratify our flesh? Why? Is that mercy given every single day today before we end? Let's take a quick look, quick look, dear brothers and sisters, before we once again, before Hannah sings for us, once again, let's, let's take a quick look what Paul is telling us. I believe that's Romans. Let's turn to Romans 12, 1. Romans 12, 1. Paul is telling us the reason why God is giving us this mercy. Romans 12 1 says, I beseech you therefore, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
So that is possible by the mercies if we receive those mercies which are new every morning. Lamentations, Jeremiah tells us 3, 22 and 23. If we receive those mercies, it has a purpose to present our bodies a living sacrifice holy once again. Once again, that terminology is coming, which today we don't want to hear holy, which today it sounds like a something like a crime, a contaminated, a convoluted terminology, a con convoluted phrase. It is not. It is a lie from the pit of hell. God is holy. And Peter tells us, the Torah tells us, and then Peter repeats for us, 1 Peter 1, 16, be holy for he is holy. We can only be holy by, by receiving his mercy, by yielding to the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Power belongs to God to judge our sins. But today is the day to Receive his mercy and to stay there, dear brothers and sisters, to stay there in the days that remain, to honor him, to glorify him, and to worship him. The Bible says, dear brothers and sisters, in First Chronicles, when we see First Chronicles chapter 16, verses, let's pick it up around verse 23, it says, Sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Let's read that once again together. First Chronicles chapter 16 verse 25 says, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Today is the day to greatly praise. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the name above every single name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he continues, for he is also to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens, honor and majesty are before him, strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before Him, all the earth. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. And let them say among nations, The Lord Reigns today is the day to proclaim. His anna sings for us. Today is the day to proclaim. Today is the day to proclaim the Lord Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Reigns today is the day to lift up our hands and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And all the earth is filled with thy glory. Today is the day. Join us, dear brothers and sisters. Let's use our best voice to glorify the one who alone, to whom alone belongs all the glory, Yeshua HaMashiach. Join us, dear brothers and sisters. As Anna sings for us, holy, holy, holy. And you can please go ahead, Anna.
glory, 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 glory to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to the name above every single name of Yeshua HaMashiach. The Bible says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And all the earth is filled with his glory. Staggering, 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 dear brothers and sisters, when we understand about the holiness as because God only can reveal his holiness to each one of us. Because we are sinful to the core. We were brought forth. We were brought forth in iniquity. We don't even understand how sinful we are as the fish does not understand in how much water the fish is. We are sinner. We are sinners in four ways as we keep sharing. Number one, we are sinners because we commit acts of sin. Secondly, we are sinners by nature. We were brought forth in iniquity. Sin doesn't make us sinners, but we sin because we have that nature. And we are in the state of sin because God has declared the entire human family, homo sapiens, entire human family under sin. And you and I are also sinners by imputation. That is, Adam acted for the human race because he was the head of it. But God is holy. He alone is holy. Oftentimes we try to understand Equate this holiness with moral purity. Yes, God is perfectly pure. But dear brothers and sisters, God is holy in the sense that he is distinct. He is distinct from his creation. And that's where, that's a rebuttal for all the pantheism and different kinds of Eastern religion. God is distinct. Yeshua HaMashiach, our holy trinity. God the Father, Yahweh Vavi. You know, his only begotten son or Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach and Ruach HaKodesh, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Trinity is distinct from the creation. And that is why Peter calls his followers, true born again believers, saved by the precious, priceless, holy blood of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth to be holy. That's not to display a moral purity because God knows. When we come to the end of the wedding of Cana, what does Messiah say? He knows what is in man. He knows what is in man. He knows what is in us. We are not here to display and trying to display our whatever efforts and ta talents and things like that and say that God is surprised with how pure we are. We, God knows everything. He's omniscient. God knows everything, dear brothers and sisters. Holiness is a call to be distinct, to be separate from the world. We are not like the world. We are separate, dear brothers and sisters, because God has made us separate. Nothing to do with us, but everything to do with Him. Today is the day to proclaim. And the more we spend time in our prayer closet, the more we understand, the more He reveals about His holiness, the more we understand how sinful we are. And more we understand how sinful, how sinful we are. The more we are subdued by his glory. We are awed in his presence by his awestruck wonder of Yeshua HaMashiach. Today is the day. The psalmist says in Psalm 73 verses 23 through 26 that nevertheless I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. That is the call for holiness. That is the call for holiness. Our heart, our stewardship, our heart, undivided attention to Lord Jesus Christ. And then the psalmist says, my flesh, Psalm 73 verse 26, my flesh and my heart fail. So before he says, whom have I, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And that is why we have hope, dear brothers and sisters. Hope against every single hope which Abraham had and Sarah had with the deadness of her womb. Because God has promised he is able, willing and able to do what he has promised for you and me today. Are we going to trust him as King David? As King David is telling in Psalm 62. 
Are we going to wait silently and patiently on him? Is our expectation only from him and him alone? And are we going to trust him today? Because some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And today before we end, let's end with the promise. Staggering promise of Isaiah 41. 10. Messiah says, God says, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Staggering, staggering, staggering. Oh, when we see the personal pronounced the emphasis, it's just staggering, dear brothers and sisters, in the days that remain, in the days that remain, which is extremely short, because we do see, dear brothers and sisters, that truly our redemption tried now. In the days that remain, let us, let us once again spend time at the foothills of the cross of Calvary at the foothills of Calvary in our prayer closet, honoring him, glorifying him, exalting him, petitioning, Lord, preserve me from my flesh. Lord, once again, preserve me from my flesh. Protect me, Lord, from all the unclean, uncleanness which surrounds me and which is within me. Help me, Lord, as I surrender myself. Mold me, Lord, and make me, Lord. You are. You are the potter and I am the clay. Mold me and make me. And please activate Romans 8, 29. The way you want it. We thank you once again, dear brothers and sisters, for joining us for our Fellowship Friday. God's divine appointment. God ordained appointment. We thank you so very much. All our dear fellow brothers and dear brothers and sisters. It's just staggering. It's just staggering. It's just staggering when the Spirit of God once again guides us and leads us when we hold hands on this virtual platform, not because of our like-mindedness, but because of the shed blood, the dam of Yeshua HaMashiach, the shed precious shed blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. When we honor Him and exalt Him and glorify Him together, there is... There is so much, so much of joy which fills our hearts. Let's keep honoring him, dear brothers and sisters. And today, let's end with a short word of prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right, you can please go ahead. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for giving us this time, Lord, to once again glorify and praise your name, Lord. And bless us as we go forth from here and help us, Lord, to remember, Lord, that you are holy, Lord. And help us, Lord, to be in your presence and to glorify you in everything we do, Lord. And to trust in you and you alone, Lord. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Once again, thank you so much, Anna, for praying for us. We thank you so very much, all our dear fellow brethren, once again, for being a part of this Fellowship Friday because it's all about Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let us keep it about Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, dear brothers and sisters, because it is, it was about Him, it is about Him, and it will always be about Him. Let us keep honoring Him, let us keep glorifying Him, and let us strive, strive every single day to be in His presence. Let us pray, O oh Lord, help me to be more pleasing in Thine eyes. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters, and may God bless each and every one of you. Shabbat Shalom.